Well, I think we're past time, so let's get started. Um, hi, everyone. I am I'm Hisham, and um, I've been involved with Lua for a long time, and uh, I'm the maintainer of Lua Rocks, the Lua package manager, and also I'm involved with other free software projects, uh, like mainly HTOP. I work at Kong, where we develop also an open source project, Kong. Uh, we're hiring, by the way, are we? Yes, we are. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we are here to talk about Lua and types and minimalism. So this talk is actually a sequel, because last year I was here at what was then called the Minimalistic Languages Developer Room to talk about minimalism versus types. So it was about like the journey of, you know, the, the difficulties between Lua and the idea of types. And uh, I hinted in the end about some further development. So my last slide was actually like to be continued. So yeah. here I am. And it's very fortunate that the, the scope of the dev room was expanded this year, and it's now called Minimalistic, Experimental, and Emerging Languages, because what I'm going to be talking about today uh, hopefully ticks all boxes. All right, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to start with a quick recap of what I talked about last year, in case you weren't here. So um, we're going to be talking about uh, adding types to languages, essentially Every like modern practical programming languages has types, even though we called some of them like typed and not typed, untyped. Like they do have types because uh, like strings and numbers, they are different things. Even if you don't have to like uh, name their, your variables, because essentially what we're talking about is having dynamically typed languages where values have types but variables don't. So any variable can accept any value. And here are a bunch of examples. And the statically typed languages where values have types but and variables also have types, right? So only things that match can be assigned to each other. Right? And in recent years, there has there been a lot of uh, interest in bringing types because they, they help the programmer to avoid mistakes. Uh, so there has been a bunch of projects related to that. Like Python has MyPy and, re and recently PyType. Ruby has Sorbet. Uh, TypeScript has become super popular for, for JavaScript. And, uh, and so on. But what about Lua? So um, last year I talked about the challenges involving, uh, involved in, in bringing types to Lua, which is such a minimalistic, tiny language. Right? There, there have been projects such as Title Lock and uh, Typed Lua, which is a, was an academic project. Right? But uh, we never really got there. So what's the, what's the main challenge, especially in a minimalistic language? Well, adding types or really adding anything to a language makes it larger, right? So it makes it larger both conceptually and also in an implementation. Um, last year, I kind of argued that conceptually, the complexity when you're writing your programs, well, not in the language itself, but in your programs, the complexity of types are already there, right? If you, you're maybe using a, a dynamically uh, typed language, but you're com constructing complex data structures and well, you have to put the right kinds of data in the right places or else your program is not correct. So the idea of all of the types, they are already there. The, 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 your program is as complex as, you know, the, as conceptually complex as, you know, the, the, its purpose. Though uh, the implementation one is hard, like hard, kind of hard to counter argue. It's, it's, it's really a thing. If you're going to be adding more stuff, more features, uh, your implementation is going to get more complex. So here's the conundrum. Like, if the language grows too much, it doesn't feel like Lua anymore. You know, if there's a tons of concepts, you know, and it starts turning in, slowly turning into C++, right? Uh, but if, the, if we keep the implementation and everything super minimalistic and simplistic, uh, then it will stop you from doing all of the powerful things that you can do with Lua, because it's like super dynamic and, uh, and very like free form, you know, as dynamic languages are. So if, if it's too simple, then it's too restrictive, and it doesn't feel like Lua anymore either, right? So, but we want both. We want a small language that fits in your head, and it's like how I like to describe Lua and why I like it. Uh, like the full reference manual is this like, small single page that you can kind of read in one go and understand everything there is to understand about the language. But also, I want a type checker that at least like catches when you make a silly typo or something like that, right? I want the practical benefits of uh, you know, doing like pair programming with the compiler, you know, in order to catch my mistakes. 
So the challenge really is to find the sweet spot between minimalism and functionality. You know, this is, this is uh, what this is about. So I'm going to be talking about TL. I'm, uh, I'm in search of a better name still, right? So this is like the temporary name that I still had last year. I still haven't found a better name yet, which is a typed dialect of, of Lua. So it's, let's talk about the minimalism part. So the implementation tries to be very minimal in the Lua spirit. Lua itself, if you download from the Lua.org website, you get like a 300K tarball, which is con for which you can build a full VM, right? And it's written in pure standard C with no dependencies. That means only standard C libraries. That means no sockets, you know, it doesn't come with batteries included. That even means no directory traversal, right? If you want to do file system manipulation, you have to get it an extra library. So TL is in that same vein. So it's a single file. It's currently as like less than 5,000 lines uh, uh, with blank lines and comments and everything, right? So it's one pure Lua file with also with no dependencies, right? And actually it's a pure TL file which is uh, transpiled, compiled, is the source to source compiled uh, uh, into, uh, into Lua, right? Uh, it is a it is a source to source comp uh, compiler, or as people nowadays call it, transpiler. So it's essentially the, the output. It's essentially your input without the types, right? So this is the breakdown of the source code on to which like every every part is, you know. So we have a lexer. We have a little pretty pinter that I use to debug the lexer, a parser written by hand, like recursive descent parser. Probably could be smaller if I had like used an external dependency to use a parser generator, but I wanted to keep everything self-contained, right? So there's like a small AST traversal that implements a visitor pattern, which I use for the pre-printer that dumps the output file. Then the type checker, which is the bulk of the thing, definition of types for the Lua standard library, which is still incomplete, you know, and a small loader that allows you to load TL files with require from Lua code. So the idea of no dependency is that it, you can take the generated uh, TL.Lua, drop it in your Lua project, and off you go. Like you can require uh, uh, you can require TL files and, and mix them with your, your with your Lua files. Of course, this has pros and cons, as I said, but for now, this is this is what I'm going with. So there's also a TL. Uh, it's not like one single file because the, the bulk of it for running it in your project is one single file. But there's also like a little command line TL file, which you can use to check a TL file. So it's going to look at your TL file, see if the types match, and if your program is going to go to the good place or the bad place. And um, then there's a gen file, which strips the types, generates a Lua uh, file but does not type check it. So even if your, type, if your program has type errors, you can still convert that to Lua and run it. And TL run, which does all things. Like it checks the file, and if it passes, it generates the Lua file in memory and just runs it uh, straight with your Lua VM so, so that the experience becomes self-contained. It has two modes of execution, which is depending on that, like the extension of your file. So .tl would make it like strict mode, and .lua would be more of a lax code, lax mode, essentially for interacting, for, for having like Lua programs that interact with TL files. So the difference would be something like this. If you write a Lua, if you, if you write code like this in Lua, which is, this is, this is fine, but if you are in strict mode, then uh, that means like you haven't annotated any, re any return types, right? So that function is annotated so that it doesn't return anything. Uh, and we don't do advanced, like in the minimal spirit, we don't do advanced uh, uh, flow inference, right? So in strict mode, this would be an error because it says like f of x does not return anything, and you're trying to get its return value here when you're, when you're calling it, right? But that would be accepted in the Lua mode because in the Lua mode, the return type of that function is unknown, which is the type of everything that it's not annotated. So if you do that, then strict mode is happy. And it knows, oh, you're, you're going to return a number and everything's fine in, in, a, in a TL file. So TL reports errors and unknowns se separately. So when you start to convert your Lua file into a TL file, it's not that you're going to get like, you know, hundreds or thousands of errors. You're going to get hundreds or thousands of unknowns, right? It, says, it will look at it and it will decide that, okay, I don't know anything about, like, there's no type annotations anywhere. I don't know basically anything about this file. 
So as you start to uh, annotate the types, then the values of the types start to propagate, things start to be le become less unknown, right? And eventually it might spot errors, and then this is how you, you gradually convert your, your program. So the type checker really, as, as we have seen, it is, it is the bulk of the compiler, right? And um, it does, it does very minimal, uh, it does just like local inference. If you initialize a variable like lo local, uh, local x equals zero, then it knows it is a number. You don't have to type in like the types every time, uh, depending, like it, it can take like the, the return, for example, in, in, in that example, it knows that f of x returns a number, so here z is a number as well. And, uh, and it also does some very, very naive uh, flow inferencing, like for, uh, things like empty tables like that. So that KS, you see, like it, it wasn't, uh, it, it, it wasn't inferred to become the string the first time it, it, the first time it was used in, in, table, in table insert. So in the end, that, that works, and it knows it to return an array of string. And, uh, and if there is an error in that, and you use it inconsistently, it will report an error. And it will say, well, I was expecting an array string because I inferred it like, at that spot. Right? It records, for anything that's inferred, it records the provenance and where it was inferred so that you can say, ah, oh, okay, that's why you guessed it wrong. Right? So the main thing about the type checker uh, and the, the bulk of its work is determining the types of tables. That's usually the most complicated thing about type checking in Lua because a table is such a general type. That's the main thing about Lua. There's no separate uh, like arrays and dictionaries and, or like lists and hashes. Everything is a table and a table can do everything. Right? So what is a Lua table in practice? When we are uh, typing it, we have to determine that. And so essentially tables in TL can be either maps. They are declared like this, you know, so like keys are strings and, and values are Boolean. Arrays declared, declared like this. They're essentially the same as, as maps with number keys, but like for rep better error reporting and like registering programming intent, uh, I kept it as a, as a separate type. Then records, which is specified by name. So a record is a table that has, you know, keys with names. An array record, which is like a record in an array all in one, which is a very common Lua pattern, in which people like store things in named keys, but also in the numbered keys store an array with that. You know, kind of like C programmers do when they do a struct and then they put an array in, in the end. So this is a very common Lua pattern, and um, I had kind of had to support it from day one. And sometimes people do array maps as well, but I have not implemented that yet. I'm sure people will ask about it like very soon as they, as more people start using it. But I just didn't have the need, so I was going with like the bare minimum that I needed because my very first project, which I talked about last year, was trying to bootstrap it. Like now we've got to the point where it did. Like by the time I ended my talk, I remember I had like 300 or something type errors, <laughs> and but now the thing actually type checks itself. So I mentioned that, that records are, are declared by name. So that was a big design choice to keep things minimalistic, to keep things small, right? There was a choice of making like uh, type systems can be, evil, ev can be either like nominal or structural. And I chose with nominal because it just makes everything simpler, essentially, like to compare if things match, you just check the names. If, you know, if the names are the same, then it's fine, right? So, so you can declare... Uh, you can declare record types like this, and then you use them by name. So for now, there is no inheritance or any kind of like interfaces or traits and, and things like that. So this is this is one limitation, and but I think eventually some of something of that kind will have to be added. Uh, but then, uh, as I was as I was writing and typing the the. As I was typing the compiler itself, the code of the compiler itself, I started writing it in Lua because TL did not exist, right? So I, so I wrote it to the point that it could start checking itself, and then I started annotating the types, right? And then I realized that, uh, well, with, when you're programming in dynam the dynamic language, with dynamic types, it's trivial to generate very generic code, right? Uh, so I realized that I actually needed generics in order to write the code like the in order to translate the code that I ha had already written in Lua right so I added that with, with the like a back tick there and as a slight nod to uh, OCaml's equality types so so this is the same code as as that one right 
but instead of like only strings, it now can work on, on, on tables of, of any kind. Because I, I either had two choices when I got to the point that I was, was translating, was typing that code. Like either I would have to add inheritance to the language and then readjust all my Lua code to make it more object oriented, or I could keep it the way I originally programmed in Lua, but then I had to have generic types. So, so I added type variables like that. They only check for equality. They're not very smart. You know, it's, it's a very minimal support that's mostly useful for things like this, which are general uh, containers of things. But it works quite well. So I, I was able to use like the, the visitor for different things, like preprinting and, and type checking and all of that. Right. So this was an important example of prioritizing the practical needs over going through a feature checklist. Right. Like, okay, I have records. I need inheritance, or I need traits, or I need this, or I need that. Right, it was going through what I needed. So yeah, types. Now what? <laughs> then I realized that once I had the types and I kept working on it, like I didn't, like all of those silly typo errors were gone because they were immediately caught by the compiler. And then all I had left were tons and tons of. Like, it seemed that every error that I got was related to nil. Like what Turing Award winner Tony Hoare called his billion-dollar mistake, right? Like adding nil references. So, uh, yeah, so we still have nils, and as in Lua, any variable of any type may be a nil. And how do you solve that? Well, in, in many statically typed languages, you have option types, right? Maybe result in, in, in Rust. But for Lua, that would be very tricky, because essentially, like, every table access can return a nil. So that means that every table access returns an option type, and you have to, like, destructure that and check, and, like, that, that really wouldn't make sense. Right, it, it would take, uh, but what if we can have the compiler detect it? You know, that would be smart, you know, and that would be fun to do. So, yeah, so I started, so this is the experimental part that I started going down this rabbit hole and doing something that I promised myself that I would not do, which would be to start doing researchy type things in the project, right? So I started writing some flow analysis to see if I could detect, like, the need for uh, optional type detection or if you can derive that that table access is never nil and, and all of that, right? So I started writing, 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 and get myself totally sidetracked into that fun project of, of dealing with nils, right? So to the point that I started to add the flow analysis and it started growing, 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 right? And, um, but essentially I was dug out by, off the rabbit hole, right? And, and, and by the FOSTEM deadline, because I wanted to have something to show here, and most importantly, by user feedback, right? And I want to uh, shout out to Patrick, uh, who's uh, been active in the GitHub uh, project over there, posting issues and just uh, just merged his first uh, PR into the project. Uh, so someone else was actually trying to use it, and they were hitting like the things that were actually missing when you want to get really work done, right? That I didn't hit when I was writing the compiler because that was just one program. Right, so it's interesting to take a look and what were those issues and how, you know, that, how that goes. So the the the, the first first of them, five minutes. All right, we are in the tail end. So uh, the first one was that was that okay, I must I want to use a I want to write a TL program. Of course I'm going to have to use Lua libraries because you know there are no TL libraries. So how do I add the types to existing Lua uh, libraries so I, so I can so I can use them? Right, so will it support something equivalent to TypeScript declaration files? So that obviously that that was like sorely needed if you wanted to do get anything done with the language, right? So yeah, so I got ahead and, and and did it like it was a very quick like ten line thing to just add that and have it. Okay, so when we're type checking, uh, I, I just blatantly copied the the TypeScript's uh, uh, standard for that, which is .d .ts. So essentially, when type checking. Before trying to require like the TL file or, or a Lua file, you just try to when type checking try to use the, the the definition file instead to read the types from. With even though the functions are not there, or, or, but when running, then you actually use the real code. The the next thing he asked for, so he says, okay, I have a definition file, so I can start writing a definition file. He started def writing a definition file for the Love 2D library for writing Lua games, right? So he got to a point there, said. Some functions in Love have multiple overloads, such as this one. But now it seems that you know TL kind of ignores the previous ones and just keeps the last. And that's what really what the compiler was doing. 
but he needed both, def both definitions. Right. So turns out that Lua does not have function overloading like that, but it's super common to fake it. Like love actually has one definition of that function, but the types are dynamic, so it just does some if type of the first argument equals this and that, you know, then do this, otherwise do that, and it feels like the user has two different functions with the same name, right? Uh, the funny thing was that I had cheated myself, and for the definition of the Stanza library, I had added polymorphic functions like that, but I did not expose the type for f in, in the language because uh, TypeScript does something complicated so as intersection types for that. But then I decided to just expose that with the exact syntax that he guessed. I said, okay, if you have multiple entries of function types in a record, you know, they are just mushed together as a, as a ad hoc polymorphic function. But then there was like the last one, which is a fun one. It's the last thing we're going to talk about here. This challenge, how do you type that table over there, which is an array of things. Well, the, the love uh, documentation says that it's okay. It's a table containing colors of the strings in that folder. Color one, string one, color two, string two, and each color is in the form red, green, blue, and alpha. Right? What's the type of this? Right? So what's the type of color, t color text? Like, that depends on how precise you want to be about it. Right? The first type could be any, which is a type that TL has that says, like, I don't know anything about this. The, or you could say, well, actually, it's a table, which is more precise. You, can pass, you cannot pass it a number, but don't know anything about a table. We could say something that uh, it's an array of something, right? Because what the user asked, he, he asked for union types, right? What he wanted to write was this. Ah, I want an array of strings or arrays of numbers, right? But uh, TL does not support that. So the best that TL can do at, at this point is number three. But this, if you can think about it, like this accepts a lot of invalid tables as well, right? You can put the colors and the names in the wrong order, and this would still accept it. It would not be a type error. So essentially, what you would want would be something like this, right? So in the, in the odd ones, you would have numbers, and in the even ones, you have strings. Like, you know, does your favorite programming language, like, can your favorite programming language express this one, right? But this still accepts invalid tables, right? Because actually what you want is, in the odd ones, you want arrays of numbers of length 4, right? But this still accepts invalid tables, right? Because, well, the, the length of the full array has to be even, because you have to have pairs of colors in, right? But this still accepts invalid things, because the numbers in there have to be between 0 and 1, right? And looks like this is now the actual real type that lives in the programmer head when like the dynamic programmer when they wrote about it when they designed the function this is the type that really had in their heads if, if, if they even if you don't realize it right but this still accepts invalid tables because this is not accounting for nil right so yeah so as you can see here like each 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 type here uh, expands on it saying like something more precise about the idea of the definition, right? You would, you would need to have like something like Idris dependently typed languages where essentially you have to define like a proof of, you know, and you could have like number eight, right? There are languages that can do that, right? But they're like mostly research languages now. TL could do number three, but if you have like the statically typed uh, mindset, you would probably write like this instead, the definition of your function, right? And then this works today in TL and would give you the same guarantee as number seven, right? So, well, so the conclusion is like types in Lua, did they deliver? Is it actually easier to maintain application working in TL? And my answer is yes, because uh, I never felt this fast programming in Lua, like uh, responding to the, to the user's feedback and like refactoring things and adding features and all of that, right? So, um, so in closing, well, TL is here. I just tagged the very first 0 0.1.0, .0, like, you know, super early, early release. Can run it, Lorox install TL. I'm still looking for a better name. Suggestions are more than welcome. And, well, Luan types, so join us. Thank you. Okay, question here.
records? Uh, generic records, uh, yes, it does have them. <laughs> I'm 95% sure. Uh, but yeah, yes, 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 it does. Yes, it does. And it's it's and it's very naive in how it matches the variables. It just like it goes very top to bottle. It does a single pass, and everything has to be like the f the first the first time the variable is used, that's the type it gets, and it works well for simple cases. Right. Uh, any other question? While well, next one sets up here. Yeah, uh, good question. In which, for which version of Lua does this work? Right now, the code is. Uh, right now, the code it generates. It's it's it's. Uh, right now, the code that it generates it supports uh, like five one and up, uh, and it can use Compat five three library in the in the in the back to to give better compatibility. This is kind of still an open question, but I, I probably want to support the latest Lua and the latest JIT, right? So, another question? No, that's a question for both of you. Uh, are there plans to take advantage of the type annotation to generate better code? Are there plans to take advantage of type annotation to generate better code? Um, no. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, I can answer this more detail after uh, my talk, but. Uh, just to give you a quick review, like the type information that LuaJet uses to optimize code is already present at runtime. This is about statically checking types before running the program, which is kind of separate to what the JIT compiler does. There you go. OK, we need to switch. Uh, yeah, we're going to switch speakers. And okay. yeah. Well, happy, happy to talk about this offline. Brilliant. Thanks again. Brilliant as usual. Yeah, hey, <laughs>